Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to it. Great to be with you on a Monday. It's Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Go Currency. Game week. It is Nebraska. It is Illinois. Always a weary matchup in the past three to four seasons. But it's a pretty big time matchup when we talk about the West race and the fact Coach Bielema and the Illini are ranked. Right? They're one of... Four, three other teams in the Big Ten ranked. And right now, uh, they, they feel like the best in the West. We'll see if uh, we're saying that a week from today. Great to be with you. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. Numbers to get in today as we talk Nebraska, Illinois, plenty of college football and NFL thoughts. Numbers to dial up at 466 3776. 466 3776. 800 825. 5865, toll free, where you can hear us across the state of Nebraska. Also, we are streaming and uh, can get involved and watch the show if you so choose. A couple of different ways. Uh, Once on Facebook with ESPN Lincoln's Facebook. Also, ESPN Lincoln's Twitter and Hale Varsity Radio's Twitter at H Varsity Radio. Give us a follow, Chris Schmidt at Schmidt underscore radio. You can find Elijah and all the pictures of his wonderful smoked brisket at Herbal Essence. We'll dive into football in a second. Son, well played. I figure I can say son and not mean it in a territorial or scumbaggy way. Dude, that looked like some fine, fine barbecue you had for ultimate fighting and your Saturday of college football. Uh, you laid out Saturday morning with the weekend edition, the brine or the rub you use. Mm-hmm. But man, it looked like you did it perfectly in briskets. Well, it's a little hard to do uh, effectively, but you nailed it. It's a labor of love. It's it's all about wrapping it at that right time and got it wrapped up in the foil. And then another huge key is wrap it for as long as you think it needs to, or sorry, rest it mm-hmm. for as la- long you as you think it needs to be no. rested. I did not. I did leave it in a cold oven for a little bit. Okay. Try to yeah, insulate a little fun. bit of that heat along with the, the, the aluminum foil is wrapped in that helped, but wrap it for as long as you, or sorry, rest it. I keep on doing that. Rest it for as long as you think it needs to be rested for, and then double that amount of time. Okay. So I, I wanted it to rest for at least an hour, and I let it rest for two hours. It really just lets all those juices sure, soak sure. back in, and, and phenomenal. Ended up uh, phenomenal, and used it to make some, get this, breakfast crunch wraps. Okay. It's a little bold, but it, it worked out well. So Pete we, Davidson didn't show up and weird out your, your, your living room. <laughs> no, but <laughs> <He that's, laughs> a little bit inspired by him. So we, okay. we did that, and then uh, we turned it into some street tacos for an uh, NFL Sunday. We still got more left. Man, in the fridge, so. that is good. I am not angry about no invite or anything. But the topic of rest, A for Elijah's brisket, B for Nebraska and Illinois, two teams that, that needed it. Nebraska has been very nicked up. We'll get to some depth chart movement that came out today, Mickey's Presser tomorrow. We'll have plenty of that. Loaded up show. Uh, we'll spend time with John Gingery in Hour 1, Lincoln East's head coach. little playoff preview, but also Malachi Coleman, the 79th best prospect in the country. Wide receiver defensive end for 2023. Had his hat ceremony, picked Nebraska. High five to Mickey if you're a big Red fan with pulling that off. And, uh, and, and keeping a uh, big-time talent home. So that was big. Uh, we'll spend time. Another podcast starting up with our friends at Herdat Media. And we always invite you to the Hale Varsity Club. They're having a live show tonight. And uh, if you're up in Omaha listening to us on 590, uh, swing on by La Vista and pop on in around 6 or so. Tommy Frazier, Matt Verzel doing uh, their show. It's uh, another pod with Herdat where – Proud to be part of the Herd at Network. And uh, that show goes at 6, the 5115 pod. Of course, Husker Hangover, the pod and stream. You can watch Sunday mornings as well with Herd at. So I wanted to give a shout out to, to Verz as uh, hour two. He'll be on with us. Charlie McBride, one hour from now, we'll get Uncle Charlie's take on how to slow down the Illini. Uh, before we get further into Illinois, big picture, 
Big Ten talk. And uh, Scott Docterman, friend of the show with The Athletic, had this story out this morning. And you have one more rodeo, one more hurrah with the West Division, Elijah. And uh, that is before your Hollywood friends move in, USC and UCLA in 2024. Things are trying to get configured with uh, just what and how the Big Ten goes to work. Do you do a divisionless format? Do you do pods for 2024 moving forward? How do you determine uh, a way that is going to, on one hand, showcase your best teams for your TV partners, games you want to see week to week? That's so much fun when it's a big game after big game after big game. And then three, protecting your teams that are good enough to be a playoff contender. It's going to expand to 12. So at worst case, the Big Ten needs to have two in each year. In some special years, you can probably make an argument for four. And a lot of years, you need to be talking about three. But two's got to be the certainty uh, of the 12, okay? And, And right now, you're going to have Ohio State and Michigan and Penn State's on that fringe, although they'll have a chance to make a statement against Ohio State this weekend. They host Ohio State. Michigan did naughty things to them. So Michigan and Ohio State are your cream. And then you have Michigan. Presumably it's Illinois right now. They look the best out of the West. Uh, They have Michigan on the road looming. They've got a win in Lincoln Saturday. I think they finish up with Northwestern and, and somebody else. They've done a lot of heavy lifting already. Okay. Uh, they've done heavy lifting already. Uh, it's kind of funny that, that they lost to Illinois, but that was... Oh, they lost to Indiana. Thank you. Thank you. They lost to Indiana. Th- th- that, was a, um, that was a blip, quite honestly. That was a game one issue. But with the Big Ten, back in the day, Nebraska was built to beat who? Nebraska was built to shut down Switzer, the Wishbone, Silly Sims, Jamel Holloway, and, and that's how you went to work. You had to compete and beat. To be the best, you got to beat the best. That's what Ric Flair says. And, and Nebraska was built to beat Oklahoma. And then it shifted. That's when uh, Nebraska shifted to a 4-3 defense from a 5-2 and shifted to be able to be fast, athletic, and tough. Could stop the run, but you had track stars off the edge and you were able to be as good as you were in man coverage and then have some safeties like Mike Brown, like Warfield, like Minter, like Toby Wright. I mean, the, the dudes that were on that back end were incredible, along with Tyron Williams, Baron Miles, Booker, Ralph Brown. I mean, the list goes on from those 90s. Teams. That's what was so unique about Nebraska. They ran the option and they ran power football. But defensively, they shut down anyone that was in the in-vogue offense of the time in the 90s. And it was a one-back offense, right? Colorado switched to it. That's what uh, the Florida schools were running. Florida and, and, and Spurrier had their own fun and gun. But Florida State was uh, a chuck at football team. Miami always had three wide and one back. Washington, the Huskies in their national championship year, they were a one-back team. And Coach Darlington has talked to me about it a lot over the years where we had to switch up, right? Oklahoma was not what they were. Colorado, Nebraska kind of regained power over, but, and then the Buffs switched to that one-back offense. You got to be great against the run, but just dynamic against the pass and be able to get after the quarterback. So when we bring it back to the here and now with this Big Ten shift that is coming, who do you – Who do you model? Who do you chase, Elijah? Because right now, Nebraska does not stack up well against who you were trying to look like in the West. They have not consistently beaten Wisconsin, Minnesota, or Iowa. They haven't done it, and they haven't done it in the same season for years where they're going to line up and play power football on you and also be really, really good against the run defensively. That's that's who you were trying to become or be as good as produce their own kind of outlier offensively. And then in the West, you know, we'll see if Ohio State has shifted away from that 
that finesse. They're great. They got NFL skills, so it doesn't matter. A lot of times you can't hit what you can't catch. But I think if I'm going to circle a team that you're going to chase, because they can, they can play anybody about anywhere with, let's, let's be honest, better than average quarterback play, more of a manager, it's Michigan. Because Michigan's got some four- and five-star dudes defensively and offensively. They've got some skill guys. They've got a, a really talented running back room. They've got a quarterback that they trust and that doesn't screw it up and can make a throw here or there, right, if he's got to. But when push comes to shove, Michigan just is physical on the line. They get after your quarterback. They stop the run. They take the football away, and then they run it down your throat. Then once in a while, they hit you over the top with some guy that's going to go catch footballs for about eight to ten years in the NFL. Not quite like they were 15 years ago with all the NFL first round wide receiver draft picks, Braylon Edwards of the world. But Michigan's really, to me, who you model because we'll see if Michigan can prove it a second year in a row and, and, and win the Big Ten. But they look really, really good, really consistent, really sound. And it doesn't matter who they play. They're going to out-physical you, and they can out-athlete you. Easier said than done, but that's that's who I'm chasing. That's who I'm building towards. If I'm Nebraska, if all of a sudden we're going to shift, because your style of play, if you're good running the football and stopping the run, and you have athletes that are good in space, you'll be able to at least match up theoretically with SC and UCLA when you play them. You'll be able to match up with Purdue, and you'll be stout enough to hang around uh, with the, the Michigans and Ohio States and, of course, those teams you may see in the West. You're going to see Iowa. You're going to see either UCLA or USC. You're probably going to see Wisconsin or Minnesota. And because of your brand, you're going to get a, a shot against Michigan, Michigan State, or Ohio State, one of those three every year. If I'm doing the math and i got a thought bubble going out loud, you're part of the TV want, right? People watch Nebraska, so you're going to be matched up in some of these big games. You're going to have some fun schedules. Not easy, but fun schedules uh, in the near future here if you go to this divisionless Big Ten. And I think the question becomes is who are you chasing in a divisionless that's, Big Ten? It's, that's, it, yeah, that's, it's, that's who you, you got you to beat. Yeah, and right now it's, as you said, it's the, the Wisconsins and the Iowas of the world, and we all saw how Scott Frost schemes matched up against the Wisconsins and the Iowas of the world, at least in, in previous years, and that the answer was not well. But then you also looked at the fact that what happened to all these Big Ten West teams? They made it through the, I guess you can call it the gauntlet of the Big Ten West. Uh, it was always a, a fun battle every single year, wide open the past few years. And then they'd go and take on the champion of the East and get absolutely crushed. More times than not, there's only been one Big Ten title. There's been a couple of Big Ten title games where Michigan State and Iowa was a, a rock fight and it was a 24-17 ball game. Uh, you had the, the year that Penn State won the East right when they beat Ohio State. Uh, in that shocker, that wide-out night game. And you had the, um, the the McSorley era where he was just throwing deep to Godwin all the time, all those 50-50 deep passes. But but Wisconsin was right there. They couldn't hold a lead. Penn State was too explosive. And, and to your point, that's what I think Nebraska should more emulate rather than, than was, uh, the Michigan is, is that Penn State of the world, uh, especially whenever you look at the, the factor of it seems right now that the prevailing wisdom is that unless something drastic changes with a new coaching staff, that Mickey Joseph would be retained, and that's sure. your, your wide receiver room, and that's what Penn State's done really well over the past couple of years is, is producing wide receivers. Godwin, uh, Jahan Dotson's looked uh, pretty good for, uh, for Washington. How's Penn State so fared in the East, though? They're still third. They're still third. They're still third, and they lost at home last year in year one to Bielema because they got out toughed. So – from a recruiting standpoint, Penn State should never get beat on the lines of scrimmage, but they've they've been more known for their skill, mm-hmm. right? And that that's a correction I think James Franklin and Penn State know they got to make. Uh, and it was they lost Larry Johnson. Larry Johnson was the D line coach for a thousand years at Penn State. Urban Meyer hired him away from Penn State, and you had that that flip. You had that flip to dominant defensive lines, not just really good but really dominant uh, defensive lines at Ohio State where they've had a succession of top three, top five defensive line picks because Larry Johnson got swayed away for more money. And my question, though, whenever you, whenever you say that Michigan and Ohio State are the teams you're trying to, to emulate is, is how realistic is that? With, with just what Nebraska is, I, I don't think Nebraska is going to be a team that can go in and compete. Can out-recruit them. And go and out-recruit and compete year in, year out, where Penn State 
they don't make it their mission to go out recruit Michigan and Ohio State. They're they, there. I mean, they're they're in they're, a lot of years they're top fifty. They're right there. There's been some years Penn State's been they've out recruited Michigan, but more, but, but more times than not, it's they have the ability to do it. Is what I'm saying, and, and that's what I'm saying. Nebraska can do is you get that occasional year where yeah, you jump up in the top fifteen of the recruiting classes, but you make your hay with that. Development you know, phase. Eight, 18 to 30 recruiting rankings, development, and then you know what? You develop a special offensive tackle, a couple special defensive linemen, and now it's your year. This is your year to make a run. So I think that's what, what Nebraska should be trying to emulate first. And if eventually you get to a, a Michigan point, and I don't want to take too much away from Michigan, what they've done in the past year and a half, because it is a small sample size, and Michigan had their warts before last season as well. So They're I don't, just I, I'm building. I'm, I'm careful to anoint them right now, but. Penn State to me just seems like that that school you try to emulate just in terms of where their recruiting rankings usually fall, which is in that say ten to twenty five range. And then the, that's you know what, not every single year is going to be a year where you want to compete for a Big Ten championship. There's gonna, there's got to be rebuilding years, which is not what the Michigans and Ohio States of the world want. You, to your point about Penn State, that's a good take. They more times than not will out athlete. They will out athlete most in the West. They'll survive a West team. They lost, I think, last time against Iowa, right? But more times than not, Penn State just finds a way to out-athlete you, and there's your difference, the Jimmys and Joes. We'll take some of your calls. Hail Varsity continues. We're presented by Currency. Chime in, 402-466-ESPN, or email the show, chris at hailvarsity.com. Just try me. Try me. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. Back with you. First part of the show. Open phones. You want to jump in. Uh, we'll get to some of your StreamYard comments. Uh, Brennan wanted to know about the fat cap for said brisket we opened the show with. Was it up or down? Up. Okay. Fat cap up. You, I, I want to let that, that fat cap as it renders I out. I think it's supposed to always be up, isn't it? A lot of those competition guys that, that have like the professional briskets, they're going uh, with the fat cap down. But I subscribe to the idea that if that fat cap is rendering out, you want it to kind of render out into the rest of the meat. So sure. I'm, I'm going to go up with the uh, with it. And um, I think the, the downward method is to kind of protect the meat from your heat source because it usually comes from the bottom mm-hmm. in, in most of your smokers. I think I think that's the, the, the rationale behind putting it. Did you foil bottom. it too or no? Foiled it after it got to the color I like on the outside. So it got uh-huh. to a nice mahogany color you. somewhere around 170 and I, I folded it up Smells to get Smells of rich mahogany. <laughs> <laughs> Matt says we need some 12 and 22 personnel. I hear you, brother. Let's rock and roll. Double tight, two back. Let's just run downhill. Let's play big boy ball. Easier said than done. Nebraska's working on that. Who's with us? We got Pete on the line. Pete, call. Thanks for calling. Go ahead, Pete. How are you doing today? We are all right, man. Go for it. I guess, in my opinion, I think where we really uh, lacked in an talent evaluation on the offense defensive lines. Our best lineman was Jurgens in the last three or four years, and he was a tight end in high school. We need somebody, we need a coach that, that's really good at, at looking at kids in high school and, and looking at the athleticism and how they can develop them into to good linemen. Uh, I think that's really been lacking uh, for quite a few years. Pete, let me ask you this, and I don't disagree that you have recruited at a high level have you developed at a high level? And right now the answer is no because of how young the guys you've been forced to play. But do you give some credit for seeing Jurgens as a center? I mean, they made him a center from a tight end, and it's gone pretty well. I mean, he's going to be uh, – looks like a talented guy in the NFL once he gets his crack. I would agree, but then they also got some highly touted guys that, that uh, are not very athletic. They can't move their feet. And it's causing big problems on the line. Don't disagree uh, there. So I, I don't know if it, Jurgens just kind of fell in their lap, but overall, there's just been a lack of talent evaluation, in my opinion. I'll give you another example. This defensive back Hill, they were talking about uh, he could make the NFL. He had the body, the speed, and all this, and bragging him up, and now he's playing offense. Well, that's not a very good evaluation of talent at, at the defensive back side of it. There just seems to be over the years especially with Frost, we hear one thing and we see the total opposite. Mm. And uh, that's got to change, I think. Hey, Pete, thanks for the phone call. Appreciate you. <laughs> Listen, I, I don't doubt Hill has all the skill to be a high-level defensive back. 
Uh, the first two games didn't go well for him. So you, what you can't tell is about a kid's confidence and resilience. And if you get passed up on the depth chart after having a bad Saturday, how do you deal with that? Or also, how do you is not it know? better to move you to offense and let you kick return? I, that's... How do you not know that Mickey Joseph went to this kid in the summer and said, hey, we want to bring you to Nebraska as a wide receiver? And he loves, he goes, you know what? I'm a cornerback at heart. Like, I'll come to Nebraska. We'll but... let you come play corner for a bit. I mean, but you... we think you're a wideout, son. Yeah, you, you don't know what's going on behind that. And then you, you, you go, okay, this guy's got a lot of athleticism. Let's give him a run out there, see how he does. And then, oh, he's not performing up to our standard. Okay, now let's go back to, to plan A. But I, I want to get back to Pete's point about the offensive line because I, I think he does – bring up a point of sorts and I don't think Nebraska has missed in evaluating guys that have potential to be great offensive linemen I think you the three top 150 guys I mean, you, you found guys that do have that potential and we've talked a lot about development uh, on this show over the past couple weeks and I think that's a part of this offensive line but I think there's also just a certain mentality that comes along with offensive line play that I haven't seen in a couple years that 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 nasty that that dog in them like what what offensive lineman has that dog you, you see guys like uh, uh, his name's slipping my mind here. Uh, the UT Chattanooga offensive lineman, uh, Strange, Cole mm-hmm. Strange, that, that the Patriots picked up. You look at that guy, and he does not look like he's going to be a high-level offensive lineman. He's about 6'2", 6'3". Um, he's 300 pounds soaking wet. Like Looks like an offensive lineman from like the 90s mm-hmm. at a school that's not even named Nebraska. But he comes out, and he's a great offensive lineman, and he's been probably the Patriots' best offensive lineman so far this season. The difference is the mentality that he has. You will listen to any interviews with him, or you go just see how he plays the f- game of football. You go, oh, this guy's got a different mentality than everyone else playing offensive line. He watches pro wrestling, and he paints his face. He's got that nasty in him, yeah. And, and that's a, a part of offensive line play that I think may have been overshadowed over the past couple of years here at Nebraska, because I don't see an offensive lineman outside of Jurgens that has that nasty in him. I mean, that's what I saw from Cam Jurgens that I love last season. That's what I think made him so great is this is a guy that he'd finish his blocks. If he's matched up on a cornerback on a play and he hears the whistle blow, he's blocking through that whistle and make sure that cornerback knows, hey, next time you see me pulling around the edge, you don't want to you don't want to mess with me. You're a, you're a dead man. I'm going to make you hurt. And it's it's that that's part of that that Nebraska offensive line mentality that I haven't seen over the past couple seasons. I, I think that is just needs to be factored in whenever you're valuing offensive line. But that comes from an offensive lineman. So uh, maybe I'm, I'm biased here, but it, I always felt like the, the best offensive lineman that I played with, played against, and now see on film, see in the NFL, see in college, they have that dog, that nasty in them. You know what else you're seeing on film? Success. Yes. And it's fair to say that the O-line has had a, a fair share of struggles in pass pro or being able to get a third and short. Not all the time, but some of the time, enough to, to ruin your confidence. And over a longer period of time, you've not won ball games here, right? You've been a far cry from what you thought you could be. So doubt has been problematic, and it's hard to be nasty and be genuinely nasty if there's some doubt crept in there because you've not had success mm-hmm. and you've not seen the wins translate. So maybe you, you have a way, the, the final five here, to unleash some of that nastiness. Or you got to really just focus on what the guys can do and what can they do well, and then you got to get better. You've got to use the bye week, but we're far enough into the season, you might be what you might be. And that's also the combination that's a struggle here. If you're whip, all right, not to not try and be balanced or have the threat of a run game, but you're not going to run your quarterback, or at least that quarterback. You have a better shot of hitting Palmer deep or finding uh, Washington on a dig route or dumping it off to Vokalek uh, and getting some yak yards that way than maybe getting a third and two. Um, so Nebraska still can't run it when they want to run it or more so when they have to run it. And that's going to be on full display. It's going to be a ball game where Nebraska is going to have to convert some third downs Saturday. Nebraska is going to have to get some help in turnovers. And Nebraska's Anthony Cup a big play. Oh, and that's, it, that's what that's what Indiana did. Mm-hmm. And then they and it was plus two in the turnovers. Indi, uh, Illinois had four turnovers. Uh, Indiana ran for a whopping thirty six yards, but Indiana threw for three hundred. Threw through in week one, game one, totally get it. But they or week zero, I should say, threw for three hundred. They threw for three thirty against that Illinois defense, and they hit some monster plays downfield. And this is something I was saying in the line change, and something I even brought up at the beginning of the show, is Illinois has not 
played a team like Nebraska outside of maybe Indiana. And so Indiana's, had, Indiana's had more success on them than anywhere else. It's because Illinois loves playing cover one. They're going to match up their corners on the outside one-on-one with your receivers, let them play man coverage. They're going to uh, stuff a couple dudes into the box and say, throw the ball on us, we dare you, see if you can get the ball up before our pass rush gets home. If Nebraska can keep Casey Thompson safe on Saturday, they have a great chance of winning this football mm-hmm. game just because of how Illinois safe likes to enough. play coverage. What does safe enough look like? like? Go watch any film from Illinois this season, and you'll see their cornerbacks are biting on the first move from the wide receivers, and they're saying, you know what? If I get burnt on a double move, I, I'll trust that my defensive line or my linebackers are going to get home to the quarterback. That's what they're betting on. They're even going single high safety. They're leaving you room to throw the ball and say, you know what? Throw the football. See if you can get it up before a pass rush gets home. That's why Illinois has been great on defense. And I mean, Wisconsin didn't have much success against them because Graham Mertz isn't good enough to do that. Iowa didn't have success against them because Graham Mertz isn't good enough to do that. Minnesota, uh, they, they lost Morgan part way through that game, which hurt them. But even then, they, they were committed to running the football. And Illinois did a pretty good job shutting that down. And whenever they got into obvious passing downs, Illinois pinned their man. ears back and got home to Tanner Morgan. So if Nebraska can keep Casey Thompson safe, there's going to be room for guys like Trey Palmer to get open. The question is, is it's a big if Nebraska yeah. can't protect Casey Thompson. Well, and, and you just laid it out between Petrus and Padilla – and you, you have Morgan's backup, who's a, a run-first quarterback, right, With that the Illinois faced, and then Mertz. I mean, Nebraska's got a big-time ball player in, in Casey Thompson that Illinois is going to have to contend with. Uh, we'll sneak this phone call in. Who's with us? we got Chris on the line. Chris, thanks for calling. Go ahead. Hey, Schmitty. Um, yeah, so it's sneaking in. I, I, maybe I, I'll have to shorten this up. Well, you you got go a couple to... minutes. Go for it, brother. The, the offensive line and the, the talent development and stuff. You got to think back, you know, to the formulas that, that worked for us years and years ago. You know, where we took a kid from high school that was six three, two thirty five, two forty, but was super athletic, and we turned him into, you know, an offensive lineman that would get out in space, you know, or you know, on a counter mm-hmm. or on the option play. Like we knew what our identity was then. So, like, if you look back over the last ten years, can we really sit and say that, like, what we knew? what our offensive identity was. I mean, I, realistically, I, we think we, we kind of knew what we wanted to be, but we weren't very good at it. Um, so maybe we were, you know, we were, we were recruiting the wrong kids uh, for what we were actually trying to do. I, I, I don't know. And well, the think about this, Chris. Is, let me jump in real quick. And you, you'll have time for part two, I promise you. Listen, you knew that your identity was to get a big play under Beck, right? Under Bo and Beck, it was gash the defense with uh, skilled guys, and you had NFL guys. But think about post Bo and the constant transition. I mean, you had different formulas and styles mixing and matching with different offensive line style recruits. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, I mean – I, I, I think you're, you're speaking to my point a little bit mm-hmm. anyway. Are, are we saying the same thing? No, we totally um, are. No, you, what you're saying, we're on the same page, brother. Secondarily, like, how, how do you really feel about our strength and conditioning program, you know, over the last eight, ten years? I mean, do you – I think – I mean, I, I know that Duvall came from, you know, our, our tree of Husker power, but, like – I, I don't feel awesome about how our guys have been physically developed from a strength and, and conditioning standpoint. Uh, they, they seem really rigid. And, and like somebody mentioned, a caller mentioned before, unathletic. You know, you think about the guys that we used to have, uh, you know, that were, they were bigger and big fat asses, squatty guys, you know, and what they, what they did, right, is you got to remember, like, these guys used to go play racquetball, like, and to develop the – you know, the flexibility and the hips and all that stuff. And, like, and they thrived on that. Now we've got these six, seven, six, nine, like, pillars of men. And they, I mean, they're big dudes, but I, I just don't think they can move like we need them. Chris, appreciate the call. Great point. It's the flexibility and athleticism that's a, a question mark right now. Coach Gingery's on the way. It's Hale Varsity Radio. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back into it, it's Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency. We welcome in longtime coach at Lincoln East. Uh, the Spartans uh, back again in uh, postseason action for football in Class A. John Gingry with his coach. We're grabbing you here uh, before the practice field. Congrats on another playoff run. Well, thanks. We, uh, we certainly appreciate that. And we're just 
excited to be there. Well, we're excited to see uh, you guys back in postseason, and that's been a, a staple. Coach, I look at the, the list uh, of all the kids that have wore the, uh, the, the blue and the white and some really special kids year after year. Eric Stokes, the Zadiskas, Jim Ebke, Chris Clem, uh, Chris Walker, uh, David Sizes, one of my pa- personal favorites, Noah Walters, and now Malachi Coleman uh, signing Saturday. Wonderful uh, reception and ceremony at, at East with his uh, intention to, to go to Nebraska. Your reaction on Malachi, the work he's put in, the, the time you guys have spent together, and, and what lies ahead for him? Well, I think, uh, you know, the, the nice thing about it is he's got a great future. I think uh, he's a kid that uh, he's untapped, and I think it's going to be uh, better and better for him. I mean, obviously, he's been surrounded by some pretty good people, which has helped, too. I mean, that's sometimes I think he'll be the first to tell you that. I mean, Walter's made a lot of people better. Um, but Malachi was, was one of the recipients of, of Noah's throws, which is great. Um so, yeah, I mean, it, it's exciting. We'll uh, see what happens. Uh, and then uh, we'll be excited to follow his, his college career. You look at uh, Malachi, and uh, Coach, you've had a lot of guys come through your, your office door to recruit your kids. And what stuck out about Mickey in Nebraska with Malachi? Well, I think he did a great job of building that relationship. I think Mickey's done an outstanding job. I mean, it's been a long time. Um, since we've had a head coach in our building. And uh, he's uh, done a good job of getting out here, communicating, uh, keeping that uh, line of communication open all the way up and down the line with me and with Malachi. And he's built a pretty strong relationship. And I think he's doing some very good things. Coach, does that shock you that it's been a while since a head coach walked through your door? (laughs) Well, a little bit. I mean, you know, I've been here for a long time. And so Coach Osborne spent time in the buildings and, and Coach Pliny was here. Um, so it, uh, it, but it's been a while. Yeah, it has. Coach John Gingery is with us here on Hale Varsity Radio talking Malachi Coleman committing over the weekend to Nebraska. And, and Coach, what have you seen on a uh, on the field from Malachi, especially this season? It's, it's been a senior year that's been difficult for him as – uh, he had a knee injury that he was dealing with early in the season, and I'm, I'm sure this, this East season hasn't been uh, as successful as he would have hoped for, even though you guys are, are into the playoffs. So well, what have you seen from him in terms of what he's brought to the field this season, d- despite some challenges? Well, I think it's helped uh, other players in our program. I think uh, he's been double teamed and triple teamed, and that's opened other things up uh, for other people. And that's been the biggest adjustment. We knew that going in. I, you know, I told him, I said, you're going to be under a microscope from day one and, and people are going to try and take you out of the game and, and how you handle that and how you mature is going to be a big part of, of you know preparation for what you do in the future. But, I mean, the biggest thing is when you get that kind of speed, it just uh, changes lots of things. You know, if we can get him vertical, get him in the open field, it sure makes it tough on defenses. Coach, when you look at Malachi at the next level, uh, you've spent a lot of time around him. Where do you think he best projects to the next level in the Big Ten? Well, I think uh, Coach wants to keep him a wide receiver. And I think, uh, you know, with that kind of speed, with 10 4 speed, you know, having somebody go vertical and just challenge the defense just changes lots of things. You know, they can get him the football downfield. I mean, it's, it's a definite threat. So that part, I mean, he's got a lot of room to grow. I mean, he's, he's uh, you know, about 6'5", and he's only about 200 pounds right now, so the kid's just going to get bigger and get stronger. So I'm looking for some pretty good things from, you know, you know in perspective. Might have been tongue-in-cheek, but were you surprised? Uh, I think there was a comment by Mickey, well, we'll throw the ball to you, and then on third down we'll send you after the quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> He can get to the quarterback. I mean, if you can get him off the edge, he's got great speed doing that. And I think that's, uh, you know, it's helped us a little bit since he's been here with us. So um, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Coach, I want to get your read on just his, his athletic potential. And, I mean, the recruiting services and, and everyone who follows Malachi seems to think that, you know, he can add that muscle onto his frame and he can just be a, a real difference maker at the college level. But do you think he's one of those guys that's just cut out for football with how his, his body's made? Or, or is he one of those guys that could be athletic no matter what sport he would have picked? Because whenever I, I see him in track and field and I see him in basketball, he just looks like a, a freak of an athlete. Yeah, I think he could be successful, you know, no matter what he did. I mean, 
you're really committed to those kinds of things, I think uh, there's just a huge upside it's just because of his athletic prowess. I mean, his speed um, is, is one of those things that just separates him from a lot of people. And uh, it's, it's just something you can't coach all the time. I mean, you, you, you have those tools or you don't. I mean, there's certain things you do to, to improve and try and improve those things in track. But he's just just it that way. John Gingery, a couple more minutes with us. Lincoln East head coach Malachi Coleman committing to Nebraska over the weekend. East uh, in the playoff chase again for this 2022 uh, high school football season in Class A. Coach going to switch over, get an early preview. I know it's just uh, a Monday, but you're uh, gearing up, ready to go, uh, get the, hit the practice field. Elkhorn South uh, is your draw, Noonan and company have had a really good season, but you guys have played a lot of a lot of talented squads. Tough. You have some impressive wins also on your resume this year. Well, Guy Rosenberg was one of my assistants early on. I mean, he's he's been a part of this program, and, and I love the guy. He's doing super things up there. He's got a great program. Um, and, and yeah, as far as practice goes, guys, it's too cold out today. We're not going to practice. I mean, we if it's not 100 degrees, we can't go. So, <laughs> that doesn't sound so. like you at all, to be quite honest. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got our work cut out for us. I mean, they've got a lot of talent. They're big, they're physical, they run the ball, they pound it, and they throw it when they have to. So and defensively, they just you know kind of line up and, and uh, play a solid defense. So... You know, hopefully there's some things we can take advantage of and, and see if we can uh, get to the outside, use our speed, and, and kind of create some problems for them that way and move the sticks and, and run the clock a little bit. I mean, it's going to be a tough challenge for us. Coach, I mean, you're out there in shorts most of the year. Are you thinking about switching from shorts to pants for for uh, for Saturday, uh, for Friday? No, definitely uh, shorts and a t-shirt. I'm not. I'm not going to cave. I'm not going to do that. You know, <laughs> it is what it is. And, uh, it's it's football season, so you know, if I get cold, I'm just going to have to tough it out. No sleeves for gang. I, I, that's how it goes. <laughs> that's how it goes. Because so my body's my body's disgusting now, so I try and cover it up as much as I can, guys. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Coach Don Gingery's with us here, Hale Varsity Radio, and Coach. I, I don't want you to reveal your offensive game plan, but but do you have anything in the works for this weekend to, to get uh, Malachi some uh, some chances in the open field or, or, or just anything up your sleeve? I, and we're syndicated in Omaha, I'll warn you, so there, there could be some, some people out there listening <laughs> along. That's a no comment. He's going to hang but, up. <laughs> but well, is anything could be done. We're going to try and utilize his speed a little bit, okay? We're going to try and, uh, and mix things up and, and create some pressure situations, and, and hopefully uh, we're able to take advantage of some of those things. So, I'm not spilling the guts, guys, but I think, you know, you know, it's it's that time of year where there's no punches held and we're just going to have to do the best we can with what we have. John Gingery, Coach, best to you. Thanks for uh, your time as always, and we'll be, uh, we'll be rooting for you on Friday. Okay, I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. One final time this hour, 10 minutes away, Uncle Charlie going to join us, Mr. Blackshirt, Charlie McBride, Matt Versal, his podcast, uh, it's six tonight, a live show with him and Tommy Frazier up at the Hale Varsity Club in La Vista. Go see the fellas and participate. Open mic night, I think, up there at uh, Hale Varsity Club. Reminder to you about our friends at Currency. They present Hale Varsity Radio for all your equipment financing needs go currency also you want to go see nebraska illinois saturday or how about husker hoops creighton basketball nfl action the one source is husker is uh, red zone tickets red zone tickets selling fun since 2001 red zone tickets.com and they are local they are good folks from omaha and they are 100 percent going to guarantee you all your orders so you'll receive authentic tickets to the experiences you want to see. Time to check that off your bucket list today and get a hold of your friends at Red Zone Tickets to create memories that will last a lifetime. RedZoneTickets.com. RedZoneTickets.com. Selling fun since 2001. Being a little no, picky, aren't we? With the uh, the old phone calls, I love it. Elijah is not letting everybody and anybody through today. You're just 
gatekeeper, baby. Well, we can say that, or we can say both have said they did not want to go on the air. But we'll go with that. We'll go with me doing my job exceptionally. <laughs> like, just like I cook brisket and I guard the phone line. <laughs> Let's hear from uh, Coach Bielema, his take on uh, Nebraska since Mickey Joseph's taken over. We were able to jump into Nebraska last week, but uh, to be noted, obviously a team that's been 2-2 two and two since transition. Um, uh, I think... Uh, Coach Joseph, because he played there, he definitely had a, a, a huge impact on kind of just what's happened since that transition. I noticed a difference on offense, defense, and really even on special teams, uh, the way they're playing the game, the way they're, uh, especially at home, which we're going into, they were able to beat an Indiana team uh, by two scores, something we weren't able to do. So uh, a very talented football team, got a lot of athletic ability on the on the perimeter, on both offense, defense. They got big guys up front that play physical Big Ten football. Uh, so a tremendous challenge for us, and I, I think they're, uh, you know, coming out of a bye week, they did very well in that Indiana game. Um, so all the key ingredients for us to be ready to play a really good game on Saturday, excited for the opportunity. So so one more here from Bielema, and this is something you got to guard against, getting all fat and happy, right? You're, uh, you're six and one, you're bull eligible, you're the favorite in the West, you're the best in the West right now, but that changes weekly, and it's the dreaded C word, complacency. I literally just had this conversation with our team during the bye week, right? Everybody, uh, and I showed examples of, of media and, and opponents and coaches, people that we play against. I put media quotes from our opponents all the time up to our team because that's the greatest indicator of what people think of you. And um, one of the things I said is consistency is a really great thing uh, when you talk about success, but it has an even evil cousin called complacency that, that can bring you bring you failure, right? And that's... That's the, that's the driving edge right now is to keep complacency out of our business, out of our building, um, offensively, defensively, uh, special teams, and, in, and especially the coaching staff as well. The evil cousin, dare I say it, the cousin Eddie of college football, complacency. So who does Nebraska have to chase here with this new landscape in the Big Ten? Who can you match up with consistently? and be better than consistently. We'll talk to Charlie McBride about it, get his thoughts on Nebraska, Illinois. What's his outlook? The Huskers are dogged seven and a half going in. Coach McBride next on Hale Varsity. Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to it. It's Hour 2. It's Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Go Currency. It is that time. It's a Monday at 5. It's Mr. Blackshirt. Charlie McBride joins us on the show. Coach, how was the weekend? Did you enjoy the bye? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, no. give me more football, baby. Yeah, right. No, I just sat here and watched everybody else kind of play. And, uh, you know, it only lasts for about one quarter. Then I switched. I, my, te- my television was so full of games, I didn't know which one to go to. So I stayed with the Big Ten. Well, that's all right. Did you, what, what games did you watch? Did you watch yeah, Iowa? I watched, yep, I watched Iowa. And, uh, did you shed a tear for them? No, not really. <laughs> I just kind of watch. I don't, you know, I I don't even know what the score was to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, I know they, I know they lost, but you know, it's kind of fun watching. You, you pick out some player and you you really watch them, and you pick out other ones. You know that probably you look at a little bit on film when you were coaching and um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> saw which one you could, you know make look funny when you snap the ball and uh <laughs> that kind of you know that kind of mm-hmm. thing and but i mean it was it was a lot of fun i i you know i kind of enjoyed it because i wasn't screaming and hollering and my wife was happy well there you go it was a calmer uh gentler coach mcbride on saturday with the bye weekend <laughs> i gotta ask you and we'll get into what the big 10 may or may not do 
in the future with divisions, whether they go away. We'll talk Illinois, Nebraska here in a moment as well. But, Coach, you recruited very well and you developed really well uh, on both lines of scrimmage. Uh, as, as you, during your time as an offensive line coach and then obviously running the defense, finding the guys defensively. How were you able to evaluate or how did you go about the evaluation of somebody that maybe was too too small, too short, too light? But the athleticism part, we focused on that this first hour with just Nebraska wanting to, to get athletes that are also tough guys that can stop the run and also open up holes to run the ball. The, the point of an athlete and also a football player. Well, I think one of the things I think we, we really make a lot of it, first of all, if you're a passing team, maybe some some things can be adjusted. But if you're a, you want to really be a good, strong front offensive line, you're going to have probably some short guys. And and I'm talking maybe uh, six two, mm-hmm. type one maybe even you know. And sometimes nowadays three hundred pounds and kids that can really are really strong. I mean, have great lower body strength and, you know, are doing things that, uh, you know, that that you want them to do in the running game. But they're also pretty good in the passing game. And, you know, I, I've always said this. This sounds a little bit stupid, but if you were a quarterback, how many six five, six six, six seven guys do you want standing in front of you when you're tra- trying to find a receiver? Mm. No, you good tell point. Me. Yeah. Well, I, I, I feel like you'd have a little well, more grace I mean, for I, the... I'm, I'm not. Listen, I'm not a quarterback, but I can. I know where I'd be coming from. You have to find. That's why they had those brooms and all those things waving in your face and everything else. In the old days, we didn't even think about that. When I started coaching, I had, we didn't even think about that. My my linemen at Arizona State were two ten. They were probably six feet tall and. Yeah. You know, but they were trained killers, and then you know it, it, that's, that's just kind of the way it was. And, and that my biggest lineman there was um, two thirty, and we played Wisconsin and beat them fifty-five to nothing, and we played Minnesota and beat them fifty-five to nothing. And so, you know, speed kills. Mm-hmm. I promise you, Arizona State is the fastest team I've ever been around in my life offensively and uh, you know I think that that, you know it's kind of an amazing thing when you look at kids you have to have athletes now Uh, the the stretch play which is offensive linemen are running a lot of Mm -hmm. you really have to be able to move laterally and your first step for a center especially if he has a guy playing over a guard that he has to reach um, is really monumental. And I, I learned that from actually Dave Remington when, with our offense running option football. He said that was the hardest thing he had to do was, was to reach a guy who was lined up over the guard mm-hmm. and, and <clears throat> things like that. So a short guy is not always the, a, a dangerous guy. you know. And, and then my talking with Coach Tenniper in the old days was, he really didn't like anybody over six four in the running game. They can pass block, <laughs> you know. It's not that, uh, but if you look at a lot of really good teams, you'll see a lot of lean guys that are, you know, explosive and and things like that. And that's kind of, you know, where I'm coming from. I I could I could turn around and 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 say this, and of course everybody will go, ooh, ooh wait a second. But if you took um, if you took Ty uh, Robinson, mm-hmm. uh, you took uh, the polar bear, and you moved them over on offense, they'd be playing in the NFL. Really? I mean, they're athletes. Yep, they're guys that can play. They're guys that are studs, and they're smart. And uh, th- whether they're good enough to be quick enough on defense, I don't know. I don't. I don't coach them. But I think they are. Mm-hmm. I think I, I think you know that uh, the more that uh, uh, Nash w- l- learns, he's going to really be a good nose. I mean, he'll be he'll be on Sunday probably, mm-hmm. and 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 the same with the and the same with Ty. 
I think those guys that those body types guys can do anything. And when you say he can do that, that means they're they're pretty good athletes. Even though at times maybe early when you're thinking and you're doing a lot of stuff, you don't do the things right or you mm-hmm. don't do it wrong. You have to be patient as a coach. Mm-hmm. So you know when I'm looking for alignment, I'm looking for number one. I'm looking for a guy that's got character i think that this really with me i'm a kind of a you know a guy that you wouldn't think maybe he's looking for character but i'll tell you to coach those kind of kids is great when they you know they just they don't win with their lips they just play and um and then things like that i think you you can look at wisconsin you can look at iowa those kids you know and wall snap they just play football they don't run around and jump up and down and do all this kind of garbage that a lot of teams do. And I think you have to learn that. Uh, I I noticed in the stands one time there were three signs out that they had big flags, and one of them, the last one, says, be humble. Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> and that was, I think, in the, in the student section. Mm-hmm. There were two other things above it, you know, dream big. and That was for you know, Sammy Fultz, yep. Yep, for Sam you know, and 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 those are the they're the truth. They're they're what they're what you that there's there's what you want, and that's when you start looking at a kid and talking to him. Mm. My wife told me that in in fifteen minutes I can tell you if the kid's a player or not, no matter how good he is, how just by the way he talks. I don't know if that's true or not, but. I haven't been wrong a whole lot. No, I don't think so either. Charlie McBride with us. Coach, let's talk Illinois. And what do you think about the job Coach Bielema has done? What do you think of Saturday's matchup? Well, I think he did the same thing that uh, he won't say it, but I think he did the same thing Bob Devaney did. Uh, When I talked to Bob when he came to Wyoming, he thought, oh, my God, you know, now i got to start all over again and do this. He said he may have the best players that he on the team that he ever had. He <laughs> said he, into thought it, huh? he was in a he thought he was in a gold mine, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, and you know, and that's how that's how things turn out. Uh, you know, and and I would say this that um, I think the next coach that comes to Nebraska is going to find a little bit of the same thing. I don't. I don't think these offense. All these offensive linemen are a bunch of rejects at all. I don't. I don't believe that. I believe that the older they get, the better they get, and they're young and they are. You know, like I used to say. You know, they just need a board with a nail in it. You know, <laughs> it's, it's you know, and, and that's an exaggeration of a nutty coach or guess or whatever you want to call it, but. Uh-huh. You know, I think you have to encourage them, um, you know, and you have to be positive with them and, and things like that. And I, I think with all this stuff going around their heads, I, I think some of them are still trying to come to earth and figure out what the heck's going on. Mm-hmm. Coach Charlie McBride's with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And Coach, the, the offensive line has a tough task on Saturday against this Illinois front seven. I was telling Schmidt earlier, from what I can see from Illinois, what they like to do is a lot of cover one with man coverage on the outside and then let their, their pass rushers pin the ears back and uh, pretty much daring an offense to, to throw it deep and say, yeah, if you can get the ball before our pass rush gets home, good luck. Whenever you hear that, and I'm not sure if you've watched any Illinois film this season or not, but... What's the what's the way that Nebraska can go about attacking that? I mean, pass rushers that are going to get after an offensive line that's been suspect in the pass rush, but you're going to have some some space to potentially take the top off with as much as they play cover one. Well, I can't say it's bad because that's exactly what we did. Uh, we 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 played a lot of man coverage, and we just sent them after them. And and we said that here here's the here's the thing that the that happens if you get a good pass rush, you get cut, you get on the guy quick, you make him throw bad, you do everything. You'll see the ball going in the ground. Everything else, you let them sit back there like good quarterbacks. Oh, you're going to be in uh, trouble. But if I was and that was happening to me, then I'd probably try to run some play, a lot of play action stuff, and a lot of stuff coming out. Mm-hmm. Not so much standing in the pocket. 
mm-hmm. because the rule that most coaches on defense will say is play pass, play the run on the way. Uh, they'll, every play's a pass is what they're going to mm-hmm. say. Most of them will say every play's a pass, but play the run on the way to the quarterback. <laughs> you know, and 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 play your gap or your responsibility first. Mm-hmm. But you got to you got to get off the ball and go to the quarter first. I mean, you have to think come off the ball like it is a pass. Go I mean, on. every play. Coach got about ninety seconds here. Your thoughts on defensively for Nebraska? Illinois has just done whatever they've wanted to running the football. Brown's a heck of a good back. Their O line, their guards, their tackles, they are very very good. How do you? Do you stack the do you stack the line? Do you make them beat and you throw the throwing the ball? I mean, what do you go about it defensively? If you you're play, Nebraska? you play what you play what you know best. Okay, it, 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 as as good as you can play it. Yeah, to 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 do something too new, to do something you're asking for trouble against good backs. Okay, the thing you every person has to keep in his mind this. In this in this kind of team with these kind of backs, the number one thing is stop the run. Mm-hmm. So you want to. One thing is, is you want to do your responsibility at the line of scrimmage as tough and as hard as you can. And so, and from that point on, you know you can rush the passer. And I, the other thing is, I think you need to try to get some, make some bad plays, and you do that by penetration, mm-hmm. and you do that by same thing coming after them, and hopefully. What you see a lot of times now is you'll see the quarterback run with the football because you've displaced your defense so much, and that that's going to happen. I mean, it's just going to happen, you know, if you got a really good quarterback. But if you don't, um, then you, then you don't have as many problems. But this kid that's transferred from uh, Syracuse mm-hmm. uh, is a good enough runner to keep you on your you know you keep your eyeballs open, but. It, don't 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 start thinking. I mean, mm-hmm. do do what you have to do and let her go. So you feel like it's an upset Saturday? Does Nebraska get it done? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Coach says take I mean, the points. These guys. I mean, this is like right. This is like heaven. You know, when you're in a situation like we're in now, if I was a player, I'd I'd go completely wacko. I mean, you you got a chance. To let them have it. What do you got to lose? I mean, <laughs> you know, you can, you know, sometimes, you know, you just kind of have to play the game. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these guys know the game because they're smart football players. And so you know, I I think that, you know, that uh, knowing Mickey a little bit, <laughs> you know, I know, I know Bill Bush. I mean, he you put a hot hat pin underneath his rear end and he's going to hit the moon. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a, He's that kind of a player, so we'll do well. Okay. All right. There we go. Charlie McBride, a Monday with Charlie, Mr. Blackshirt himself. Feels good about Saturday. Uh, tough matchup, but, hey, ABC, prime time, 230 kick. Rank the line I come in, and you can um, can play with a uh, little bit of nothing to lose. I mean, it's a big game, but pressure's really on the Illini, man, for that West race. All you do is just bend over and play Smash Mouth, and 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 remember this: is that there's already somebody in your family that I always used to pick out that I'm going to play this game for him or her or it. Even one game, I think I played for my dog, and she was blind, but <laughs> I did it anyway. Coach, we will we will talk Monday. You have a great weekend. Thank you. Okay, thanks, guys. Bye now. And now, and now back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back into it, it's Hale Varsity. We're presented by Currency. Let's talk some Husker football with a Husker from Central Nebraska. Also knows how to make a piece of pizza. We say hi to Matt Verzel. Verz, it's been a while, man. How you doing? Good to spend a few minutes with you. Good, buddy. How you been? I'm hanging in. I'm absolutely hanging in. I'm, I'm intrigued with how this football season's going to shake out, Vers. And I'm also loving uh, Husker Hangover with her dad. And I'm seeing your beautiful face on, on all streaming channels, man. Oh, well, it's 
it's definitely new having to be on the video screen, which I'm not a huge fan of. I know, I know my strengths, and that is is behind the camera. I, I have a face built for radio. <laughs> so let me ask you this: How much makeup are you using? You know, nobody has gotten to that point yet. Um, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> no, people people have asked. They asked me during the, do you have any makeup? I'm like, no, I don't. That's just my skin. That's just the way it looks. The gray beard and the and the lack of pigmentation is this. This is what you get. Are you going to do a, a, a kiss or a GNR tribute with any eyeliner? No, no, I'll probably pass on that. Just the bald head gets shiny every now and then, so got to get a little. I don't even know what, what takes the shine off. We got to do that. Uh, Matt Verzo with us. Find him on Twitter at uh, Verz fifty one. Verz, we'll get into some Nebraska here in a moment, but uh, you're you're doing the Husker Hangover with Hurt at Sports, but also you launch a a, a podcast tonight live at the Hale Varsity Club in La Vista. We love being up there on, on Fridays for, for road uh, weekends, but it's the 5115 pod. It's you and Touchdown Tommy Frazier. Uh, I think folks will love this, and they'll get a chance to see it live tonight. Uh, you go back a ways with, with T. Frazier, don't you? Yeah, yeah, we're both in the class of 92. Um, Tommy and I, he, he comes to Paisans and eats, and, and we catch up. And We were both kind of on the um, – same side of the fence. We had a little, you know, pump the brakes when, when the prior regime had entered. Everybody needs to, to manage expectation and and keep stuff kind of under wraps. And we got, we both caught hell for that. So we were talking and I said, hey, I think I'm going to start a, pod, a podcast up because I had done a couple in the past. He said, well, I want to do a podcast with you. So okay. So we threw 5115 together and we get on. We've just been doing some, some breakdowns of the games, kind of getting our footing, seeing how we – what, what shots we can take at each other, what shots we can't take at each other. So it's, it's been fun. It's always good to catch up with your buddies, and we'll have guys on throughout the year as we get our get our footing, as they say. Matt Verzel with us, Hale Varsity Radio, 6 to 8 tonight, live podcast with uh, Matt Verzel and, of course, uh, Tommy Frazier, 51 15, 6 to 8 in La Vista, uh, the Hale Varsity Club. Go check that out if you need a wing and a beer and a burger. Uh, tonight after you have your slice of pies on, of course. Now, Verz, uh, a thought with uh, with that previous regime, and there's a lot out there, and he was a, a teammate of yours, and I'm interested here as to, to the, the why uh, between recruiting, between evaluation, practice style, pressure. I mean, it was – it was, it was a tough four and a half years for fans, but it was a tough four and a half years for a lot of folks on that staff. Yeah, the, the thing that I don't think anybody wanted to – listen, you got a guy coming back that, that's got – he played at Nebraska, he won at Nebraska, he's got a chance to revitalize the program. But I don't think anybody fully comprehended behind the scenes what was going on. You know, the, the lack of discipline that the team had – back then before they got here and, and those kind of things that extrapolate out that lead into it and what you want to do as a coach is you just want to coach the minutia and all that is the last thing you want to deal with you know like I'm lucky enough Matt Terman for some reason hired me at Omaha Scott Catholic and I get to coach their offensive line and you know, we get into the season this time of the year and we do different things for the boys before the game and I got neurotic mothers that won't leave me alone. I'm just like, lady, I've got this under control. I've had it under control for three weeks. I just, deep breath, I'm not going to harm your child in any way. So what Scott and the crew were inheriting, I don't think you could fully you could fully quantify. And so when you just want to go coach football, but now you got to go deal with all this other stuff, it makes it hard. And it takes it, it takes, now you signed up for it, you're being paid well, so you better figure out how to do it. Or appoint good people to do it. And I think maybe that's something that, that doesn't get enough run is the people around him probably let him down a little bit more than, than anybody had expected. But it, it seemed to just compile on itself, and it was, you know, Trev made the move, and, and now we're on with Mickey, and the boys seem to be playing as a team and playing hard, and that's all we can ask, you know, for right now until they continue to progress. So hopefully this off week, they come out of the off week with a lot more of uh, the same that we saw from the first off week. 
Matt Verzel's with us, Hale Varsity Radio. Verz, you know, the offensive line and defensive line is how you're going to win, and it's how you guys won. You had great skill, but you had the, the attitudes and the ability on the interior. How, and you, you lived it as a lineman, how big a deal was it to have two offensive line coaches? Um, it helped. It was, you know, Coach Young and Coach Temper were both awesome guys. Mm-hmm. And and we knew they were going to light us up. Now, we also knew, some of us knew, they just took a chance on us, okay? We didn't fit the matrix. We didn't, we weren't six foot six and, and a chiseled 290. You know, Aaron Taylor, five foot seven, closer to 400 than 300, but had <laughs> sweet feet and could move, you know. Um, five seven four bills we, okay <laughs> yeah on a, on a good day on a real good day but, but we had we had dudes that just we, we weren't flashy we, we flashed on film and that was it you know they you look at now what they're trying to fit linemen into here's who would not be there at nebraska dave remington will shields Dominic Rayola and Aaron Taylor would not have played at Nebraska. That's pretty good starting four or five. You could put those guys in. I know there's a few centers, a lot of guards in there, but those guys would never have been to Nebraska. Now, you can't tell me that, that that's right. You find football players that are aggressive and mean and nasty and, and want to win, and they may be short. That's okay but they're good at what they do and they like doing what they do. And when you get those things, instead of trying to find the perfect genetically <laughs> mutated human being to play the position, you're good. So the defensive, I'm in the same boat, but they weren't the fastest. They weren't the strongest mean as a snake, but wanted to play and wanted to win. And that's what, that's where you have to build it. It's gotta be rebuilt from the lines and it's gotta be the focus of all recruiting from this point on. Matt Verzel with us uh, and uh, part of Hurt at Sports, the podcast tonight at the Hale Varsity Club, 6 to 8, 51 15. Matt Verzel, Tommy Frazier. Verz, uh, I think we're on the same page with uh, the O line, the D line. What do you think? What do you like most about Mickey uh, and what he's been able to do? Because right now he's a, he's a favorite or a fan favorite, at least, to, to get the gig. Mickey has a really strong presence. Um, you know, the leadership, the leadership that, that, that he's been able to provide is, is crazy to me. Um, not that I was doubting that he couldn't do it, but, man, he has got command of a room when he goes into it. Um, a couple of my other teammates from a while ago posted a picture of Mickey talking to the team, and, and there isn't an eye that's not on him, which, you know, they're kid, like, we're talking about college because like, they're screwing around all the time, but everyone has his attention and, and, and it's awesome. It, it's really, really cool to see. Um, he handles the pressers. Well, um, there is no, no one is outside of, of an ass chewing. Like as he showed, you know, he gave it to Casey Thompson on the sidelines uh, a couple games ago, like just really impressed with how he handles himself and the situations. And, Man, I know it's not a popular opinion, and I know everybody's like, oh, we got to get this guy and that guy. That Dabo Sweeney model isn't too bad when you got a guy that's charismatic and is a leader, and you got a pretty big fat wallet at dear old Nebraska where you can say, okay, Mickey, you're going to be in charge of getting all the goodies. You're going to do all the press conferences. You're going to get all the recruits that the coaches want. Here's a mill five to go get an OC. Here's a mill five to go get a DC and go get great ones. And you just, you, you shake babies and you kiss hands. That's what you do. And you <laughs> touch every group. But I, I think that's, I, I've just been so impressed with what he does. I, and I, I hadn't had the chance to meet him yet. I can't, I can't wait to get the chance to meet him. I think it's going to be awesome. Matt Verzel's with us. Uh, the Husker Hangover, you check out with Herd at Sports. Streams every Sunday morning. The podcast with Tommy Frazier, the 5115 pod. Also with Herd at and uh, you're listening to Hale Varsity Radio. Verz, I always love spending time and talking ball with you, man. Your passion's incredible. Uh, when it comes to, 
to practice in the the, the right way. Uh, it feels like Mickey's got that flipped. More contact, more tackling, more hitting. You you gotta if you want to be good at something, you emphasize it. Do you have hope that the run game can can get better, can improve, or as an old lineman, do you look at what's down there and say we kind of are what we are? The um. To, to run or to be good at running, you have to call running plays. I know. And <laughs> there's, we get a little pass happy at times. Um, but I, I can understand why it isn't, why those aren't called. It, that, that right to run those plays has to be earned. And, and sometimes when that happens or they're called, it doesn't, we don't execute very well. Um, there's things that they need to fix in training, and I don't know if those are things that can be fixed in the year, during the year. Mm. You know, the hip hinge that they have needs some work, the explosion out of that stance. Um, your friend, my friend, Damon Bang, calls it short area quickness. I just call it explosion. Um, but getting out and getting into someone, and, and you know, we, we lose a little bit of technique on double teams at times. Um, those things can all be brushed up. Technique can be brushed up in, in off weeks. The hip stuff and, and that flexibility and mobility are, are tough. One of the undersold parts of, of offensive and defensive linemen is how athletic they are. You know, when, when you're good, Zach Weir will always pop to mind. Will Shields will always pop to mind. When you're talking about an athletic offensive lineman, they get out in space and, and there isn't a miss. That, that corner, that outside backer, that safety is going to get put in a world of hurt. And so that, that part of it is, is maybe missing a little bit. But you can tailor calls to what your strengths are. And I think at times Nebraska does it really well. And at times we get away from it trying to do maybe a little too much. And now. And now back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back with you, Hale Varsity Radio. A few more minutes here with Matt Verzel, part of Herd at Sports. His podcast with Tommy Frazier, the 51-15 pod. In a few minutes at 6 o'clock at the Hale Varsity Club in La Vista. Open mics. Want to talk some ball with the fellas. Uh, more with Verz here and getting Nebraska's run game back. But I'd have six, eight plays, maybe even four to six plays that I know my guys are real good at against every front, and I just pound those all the time. Verz, okay, we're on the same page that Mickey's been an incredible leader. If you get a phone call from the AD and money's no object and availability's no object, who's your number one name? You can hire anybody. Number one, as, as an offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, or head coach? As in he- head coach. You can go get anybody. Who do you like most? Um, you probably – I'm an, I'm an in-the-moment guy mm-hmm. with a long-range outlook. Um, oh, goodness. Um, number one, I, I would I – would, on my list, if I'm going on my short list, number one is, is Mickey. Okay. Okay. Number two is, is probably going to be Dave Aranda. Okay. Out, out of Baylor for this reason. I eliminate any chance that Mickey may go somewhere else because everybody that we have that is a, is a high quality player or performing at a high level is tied to Mickey. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Dave and Mickey work together at LSU, work with Bush at LSU. They know each other. I think you're going to maintain a core there. Um, I have no problem with anything Lance Leipold does at, at Kansas at wherever he's been. Wisconsin Whitewater Buffalo. He obviously know he understands how to build um, and build the culture. I know they've, they've they've been getting out talented in the past few games, but that's that's going to happen. Um, and then you know the climbing climbing pick out of K State. I'm fine with that. I, I don't think you can go wrong. I just think you need to have everything laid out of why you made the decision you did, and be very clear with those things but also then making sure Mickey is taken care of and stays on board. Amen to that. Matt Verzel with us. Verz, last thought here, and you do a, a wonderful job you have for years coaching high school ball at Scott. You'll start the playoffs against Blair Friday. We'll have games uh, here locally, Southwest, I know Southeast. 
uh, in action as well. Your two nephews are just super talents to watch. Uh, great family, the Butenbacks. And, you know, uh, in-state talent, you've been around it for a long time. Is it as good as it's been in a while, in your opinion, or is it just finally getting noticed? It's always been good um, for whatever reason. And there's no, you know, prior regimes, go, you can go back all the way to, to Slick Willie Callahan. They yeah. just, they thought it was lesser than, which means to me, you have no vision as a coach as far as your development plan goes. You, you're you're looking for the crapshoot of ready-made, okay? Mm-hmm. Ready-made kid is going to work. Sometimes it's not going to work sometimes. But if I have a development plan, I can take kids from all over the state. I can take kids from anywhere and, and be good if I have this development plan. Um, you cannot miss, you know, the best quarterback that, that we're probably going to see in this state for the next five to eight years. Yeah. Zane Flores, to have no contact with him is an embarrassment. Um, Zane is, like, that's the real deal. He, he's got every throw on the field. Um, he's a leader. He's running the ball a little bit more this year. Um, you got big linemen that have gotten out of the state. You've got tight ends that have gone. You've got running backs that have gone. You know, it's just to, to overlook your home state is is crazy to me because it's so counterintuitive to anything I would want my university to be. It's it's the University of Nebraska. It's not the University of everywhere else but Nebraska. You know, you got to have the in-state talent with the family ties that are passionate to it. Um, on minuscule senses, my buddies and I still talk about when, when we took some of the fellows from little more urban areas up to my grandma's farm, and they were how'd that go? Like, well, this, was there some bull riding? Like, well, this is real. <laughs> oh, my my grandma and Larry Townsend, thick as thieves, in about ten minutes. <laughs> yeah. But it's that's awesome. You, you know that that's what it's about because it's about the state. It's a state university. It's not a, an out of state university. It's what it is. And you want to control that and kids that are good. You want them there. And, and, you know, you, you've got a few in and out and the boys are doing good and they're playing hard, but you got to make sure it's, it's more rare that any leave than it is rare that they come to Nebraska. You know, if you get one, it should be a major accomplishment for someone to get one out of the state of Nebraska, especially a legacy. It pisses me off every day that I know Isaac Zaska is at, is at Mizzou. Mm. I, I can't. It, it drives me bonkers because he's a kid that you put two years of development, and he's a starter. He's got bloodline, he's got lineage, and he's a mean dude. Mm. But it is what it is, and we are where we are. So fix that. Repair, repair relationships with – with high school coaches and make sure they come through or they've seen somebody that they think you might have missed. You can trust their judgment. You get them in there. Matt Verzel. Verz, enjoy the pod tonight with Tommy at the Hale Varsity Club. We'll do this again. Thanks for being gracious with your time as always, bud. You bet. Yeah, all those two. Um, Tommy wanted me to make sure everybody knows that those of you that um, voiced your opinion at him voicing his opinion, there will be open microphones tonight. You can come out. You can ask Tommy whatever question you want. You can say, hey, you were right. I was wrong, which I really think is what he wants to hear. <laughs> so, <laughs> there, will be, there will be open microphones for folks to um, to discuss tonight at the Ale Varsity Club. Yep. In La Vista, stop on by Verz and Tommy Frazier at 6. Guys, take care. Appreciate you, Verz. Nice to meet you. See you. Good stuff from Matt Verzel. Uh, that fifty one fifteen pod is uh, live in about twelve minutes. You're hearing us on uh, five ninety in Omaha, Beeline over there to La Vista. If you're in Columbus on News Talk nine hundred, well, get a get a order in so you can show up and get a beer and a and a burger. Beer burger. You got the uh, the short rib mac. Which I, yes, I, I, that looks really good. They, they just dropped that on us via email. Yeah, I, and I'm having short rib withdrawal. It's been a weekend since I've had short ribs. Yeah, and I, I think that now goes to the top of my list in terms of next things to order at the Hale Varsity Club because there's always another next right. thing. Right, well, we're there for Michigan yes. the Friday before Michigan. Well, see, I still haven't decided whether or not I'm going to be going to the big house this year or not. Well, I'm there <laughs> before Michigan.
We'll, we'll see about me. <laughs> uh, we will be at the Single Barrel on, on Friday from, uh, from 4 to 6. Road show Friday. So come get your uh, steak and beer or whiskey. Uh, get that handled. Be sure to get that handled. But if you do have uh, a cocktail or several, you uh, decide to invibe, please do not. Uh, drink and drive a message from the nebraska department of highway safety what do they ask you to do buckle up use your seat belt it saves lives it prevents injuries only if properly worn buckle up a message from the nebraska department of highway safety office put a bow on a monday plenty of thoughts on you know who does nebraska need to be in this new big 10 west you got to match up against everybody, all sorts of different styles. But if your style is as good as a Michigan, doesn't matter who you play, they got to kind of adapt to you. We'll hear from the Pirate as well. Hey, Varsity winds it down next. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HailVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. Good stuff today. It is Illinois week. Big thanks, John Gingery on Malachi Coleman, East Head football coach, as he's playoff bound. Mr. Blackshirt, Charlie McBride. Be sure to catch Coach McBride and John Gingery and Matt Verzel on the podcast, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, and the Hale Varsity channel uh, on uh, YouTube. This is getting uh, juicy between James Franklin and Jim Harbaugh. Harbaugh asked again about Penn State taking issue with the tunnel in Michigan. There's one way in, one and one way out. And a lot of these old Big Ten stadiums, right, or even South Bend between South Bend and, and Miami, if you think back to it, uh, with the uh, the uh, late 80s showdown between the Canes and, and the Irish. Go through them or go around them, <laughs> right? And that didn't work out real well. But you had Franklin freaking out, screaming, and that was caught, captured by video. There's no video of this. This is a quote, but Harbaugh kind of sick of talking about it, right? I mean, Penn State's got to take on Ohio State, hosting Ohio State. Michigan's unbeaten in, in a, a playoff run right now. I've got bigger fish to fry than Coach Franklin's opinion on our tunnel a week ago. Such a sophomore ploy to keep us out of our own locker room. Looked like it was he was the ringleader of it. So, uh, how about I didn't get to pull punches? Uh, Brett Beal and I not pulling punches on Lincoln as a venue, as an atmosphere, and uh, Illinois head coach, nothing but respect for Memorial Stadium. Yeah, so my first experience, I was an assistant at, at Iowa. Uh, we had a home-and-home home series uh, against Nebraska uh, back in the day before there was ever, uh, you know, this new conference realignment. It was strictly just a home-and-home home, uh, against a, a, a Nebraska opponent, and I remember going over there and, uh, getting the cheers running on the field, right? And, and then they cheered louder when he left because he lost. Um, but then my next experience, I was at uh, Nebraska, or I was at Kansas State, uh, and we went there um, and, and we actually had success and won there. And I think it was the first time um, Kansas State had been uh, to New Lincoln and beat uh, them there. And like, it was like 30, 40 years, whatever it was. And then the next year they came to our place uh, and we, we did it again, right? So I, I really. Uh, enjoyed the tenacity of the the, uh, the environment we played in, and then, um, you know, uh, actually the last time that was the last time I was there because we didn't we didn't play them uh, during my tenure at Wisconsin at, at their place. So um, it's a great environment, um, very comparable in my mind. It's a it's it's uh, kind of like some of your Big Ten venues. They're very it's a very vertical stadium, a lot of people, um, uh, very interactive crowd, and and uh, one that I'm excited to let our guys play. So he uh, remembers Lincoln well as uh, an assistant at K-State. I swear I thought he was head coach there in 2012. I think he was. That didn't go the, well. The Scrabble game, right? Where, where Wisconsin had the big W on their chest. Yeah, it was the ugly uniform chest. game. Yeah. yeah, he was there. They had a big old lead and then couldn't hold on to it. And maybe that's why he wanted to scrub but, that one from his memory. But, because then he would turn it around he, and, and beat Nebraska in the Big Ten championship 70. game. Yeah. yeah. We have time for the pirate or no? We are running out of time. Well, no. we'll we'll hear from the pirate tomorrow. But you know, a year ago at this time, Brett Bielema called out his offensive line and says, "Look, some of you dudes can't play in the Big Ten. I'm paraphrasing. 
and they go out and they shut out Penn State, or it was 13-3, to but they won in Happy Valley. Just out-muscled them on his way to a 5-7 five and seven season one. But yeah, listen to his presser today. He's, man, he's such a put-together head coach with his plans, and he, is, he has Illinois rolling. Talk to you tomorrow. Jay Moore, Big Red Wrap-Up with us. Uh, we'll spend time with Mitch Sherman. Thanks.